Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our Lunch Hour Distinguished Leaders Lecture Series, uh, sponsored by Southern Glazers Wine and Spirits. Uh, I'm John Quelch, Dean of the University of Miami Herbert Business School. Uh, thrilled to be able today to uh, welcome uh, Secretary Azar uh, to our series. Uh, and in a moment, uh, our president, Julio Frank, uh, former health minister of Mexico, uh, prior to being dean of the School of Public Health at Harvard, will introduce the secretary. Uh, but I just want to thank uh, all of our faculty, staff, students, alumni, and friends from around the world uh, for being with us, as well as uh, some of our trustees. And a special shout out to uh, students in our executive MBA program in healthcare management, and also to our students in our Masters in Health Administration program. Uh, thank you very much for being with us again as well today. Uh, without further ado, let me pass you over to uh, uh, President Frank. Thank you, Dean Quelch, and thank you all for joining in this afternoon. As we continue to engage virtually, we have at attracted truly outstanding speakers to the Miami Business Herbert School, Herbert Business School. Our speaker for today's distinguished lecture series is um, Alex Azar, who was sworn in as President Trump's Secretary of Health and Human Services in January of 2018. Secretary Azar has spent his career working in senior healthcare leadership roles in both the public and the private sectors. His current tenure at HHS is a second tour of duty at the department after serving as general counsel and then deputy secretary in the 2000s, which is when I had the great honor of meeting him. Uh, because former secretary Tommy Thompson, who was actually my counterpart during my time as Mexico's federal secretary of health, he credited actually secretary Azar with being instrumental to the United States effective responses to the anthrax attacks of the early 2000s to SARS and other coronavirus and to influence them. Obviously today, all of Secretary Azar's big experience, great experience is being put to the test as the world copes with the COVID-19 pandemic. I have often noted that global problems require global solutions. And the topic of Secretary Azar's lecture this afternoon, United States support for Latin American and Caribbean health systems what we are doing and what more we can do, that topic really resonates in a especially strong way here in Miami, which is of course the crossroads of the Americas. So please join me in thanking Secretary Azar for taking time out of his incredibly busy schedule to share his insights with us today and help me give him a warm Miami welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Frank. Uh, uh, so, uh, Secretary Azar, we've had uh, a number of uh, business leaders on these calls this year. Um, I think it's very important for the audience to uh, understand your own uh, personal leadership journey from uh, uh, being, uh, I think, a graduate of Yale Law School and then a corporate lawyer and then uh, uh, a tour of duty, as President Frank mentioned, at the uh, White House uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the deputy secretary role, then uh, working as the head of North America for a major pharmaceutical company and now uh, back at uh, HHS. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that leadership journey evolved? Did you plan it that way? Was it serendipitous? And uh, what did you learn at each stage of that uh, journey that helped you become uh, the leader you are today? Well, Dean, first, thank, thank you for having me, and President Frank, thank you for welcoming me. It's so good to see uh, President Frank again after an absence of 14 years, uh, uh, really one of the great public health leaders in the world, and uh, just so delighted uh, that you're in this role and, uh, and to be with you today. Um, <clears throat> so, Dean, I, I guess for all of us who lead large organizations and lead people, uh, that, that journey of professional development and leadership, I hope, is a daily and ongoing one of, of learning. As you mentioned, I'm a recovering lawyer. I didn't go to business school. I did not have the benefit of, uh, of studying under Eudine or uh, going to Miami's business school. But 
Um, I've had to learn on the job. Uh, and I, I, I like to tell people that uh, in my first job as general counsel of HHS back in 2001, was my first time actually leading people, uh, more than just a, a small virtual group of people that, uh, that would have been at a law firm, say. Um, and I was coming, I, I pose this scenario for you, coming into, a, at that time, about 75,000 person department, I think it was about $600 million, it was very small back then, uh, $600 million a year budget. I had about 450 lawyers. I did not, I was not a healthcare lawyer, uh, coming in, so I did not have subject matter, subject matter expertise. I was a, uh, I did government, what we call administrative law in the United States and white collar criminal investigations, but nothing healthcare focused in any way. And I was coming in to lead a team of 450 lawyers who were deep experts. Um, one of the gentlemen who was an asso career associate general counsel had literally been in the public health division, which he now led since five years before I was born. And so I was not going to have much that I could teach him about public health law, but I was there. And I talked to my mentor, uh, Ken Starr, uh, who I had worked with, Judge Starr. Uh, I talked to him about this challenge of coming in and being a, a young, I think I was 33 years old and leading, leading all these people. And he said, Alex, you just have to ask yourself a question. Do you want them to want you to succeed or do you want them to want you to fail and act accordingly? And that really has become my mantra, and I hope, I don't always live up to it, but I hope the cornerstone of how I lead people and organizations is um, to try to engage people, to add value where I can, to, but to, to delegate, to respect expertise, to use the brain power that I've got and experience and judgment I've got to question, to hold accountable, but not to try to do their job for them. And so when I came and I said to the team, I don't have anything to teach you about public health law or FDA law or Medicare law, uh, but I hope I'll add value by challenging you, holding you accountable, and by virtue of the Constitution of the President of the United States, I'm sort of first among equals on this team. It is what it is, but, uh, but I view us as partners in that journey. And just, I think, really just learned on the job the importance of having a highly engaged workforce. Um, we invested in uh, knowledge management and training in ways that hadn't been done before. And I, I guess I got to start seeing the true importance that of, of employee engagement in delivering the difference between compliance and commitment and what can be produced when you can lead a highly engaged workforce. And continued that as a lawyer, so advising. Um, I Then when I became in the second term of President Bush, I became the deputy secretary, which is the number two person and chief operating officer of the department. I switched from being a lawyer to being a client. And I think I dispositionally learned that um, I much prefer to be the client than the advisor, the decider than the advisor. And I think, I think one is just genetically wired sometimes for a preference of one or the other. Um, and I just prefer to be carrying the football than, than advising the person carrying it. <clears throat> and it just, it just felt very natural to me, and that became where I wanted to continue. Uh, I continued developing there. Um, and then when I left the government, went, as you mentioned, to a big pharmaceutical company. And there, in the government, you can learn leadership by doing. You can learn by coaching, by mentors. But there's no systemic approaches, especially not at the high level. And... Um, one of the real benefits of working at a very large academy-like corporation is just the significant intensive training, uh, the intensive self-scrutiny and 360 reviews and evaluation that can at some point be demoralizing a bit, uh, but uh, the, you know, the constant self-criticism, the constant learning and understanding your, your defects or your areas that you need to compensate for. I learned a lot about my sort of leadership skill set, and what I do is I try to build teams around me that compensate. Uh, I know where I know where I'm strongest. I know where my weak areas are, and I try to actually build the team around me to ensure a diversity of perspectives, but also that really compensate for where I would say I over-index or under-index in certain skills or behavioral areas. Um, a passion of mine has always been execution. Just how do we get from A to Z? Deliver results. Uh, and uh, it may be that that comes from having been a lawyer where execution is not necessarily part of the, part of the core set, but I've been very focused on 
how do you build repeatable process systems of execution to constantly deliver quality results? Um, and so I, I started very early on using a technique called the four disciplines of execution, which is a Franklin Covey methodology. Uh, very, very basic. Uh, what I like is it's unlike even Six Sigma, very basic concepts of uh, uh, define very clear lead measures uh, of, 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 sorry, lag measures, X to Y by win. If it doesn't have an X to Y by win, it's not a goal. There's no accountability. Um, define your lead measures, which are what are the weekly things that you can get data on that are predictive of ultimate attainment of your lag measures. Um, build a cadence of accountability. So whether it's weekly sessions, monthly sessions, or daily sessions, there is a power in that peer pressure driving execution and performance from the convening power of jobs like mine. And then fourth, develop a compelling scorecard that motivates the team that they can rally around. Um, and I actually helped collaborate a bit on a book on that subject. It's a tactic that I use to lead. There are many that are successful. Um, but really at its core, I try to lead highly engaged teams of people. I think that winning is a key attribute of engagement. So I, I want teams that have a sense of, of, of uh, as Secretary Pompeo has called it, swagger. Um, I, I would call it uh, team winning. Uh, I, want, I want teams to build by repeated achievement the self-confidence that no matter what the challenge, they can sort of take that beach, they can do it. And that feeds on itself. Success breeds success, and so you need to set your teams up for success. It builds that morale, builds the engagement, builds customer service, customer centricity, and that delivers long-term sustained, repeatable business results. And I, I used to joke that I wish I could go back and do my job as deputy secretary with what I had learned in the corporate world about leadership, process engineering, um, and results. And then all of a sudden I got the call. <laughs> so I tried, I tried. The government's different, uh, different than, 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 the, uh, than the private sector, but big, large, cumbersome bureaucracies are actually more similar than a lot of business leaders would like to think. At my company, they would get mad a lot. They'd say, well, you know, how, how is being in government different than being in the corporate world? And I'd say, you know, uh, more process driven, slower, less sense of urgency. And they'd say, oh, HHS? I'd say, oh, no, no, the corporate world. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for uh, that very insightful answer, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, you know, our football, team, our football team is doing very well here, as you may know at the moment. So uh, uh, Miami swagger is uh, not an unknown phenomenon in these parts. Um, let, let me turn to the uh, subject uh, of, the, uh, of the day. Um, as uh, President Frank said, we're at the crossroads of the Americas here in Miami and position ourselves as a hemispheric uh, innovation hub at the university. Um, so we're very curious to know what in terms of uh, the healthcare systems in Latin America and the Caribbean, what does HHS uh, and the US more broadly offer and uh, deliver, uh, and you have a 20-year perspective on, on how that has evolved. Well, and um, uh, I think this will be uh, hopefully gratifying to President Frank to hear just how, how focused we have been here at HHS and in the U.S. government in our hemisphere around healthcare. Uh, I have traveled within, um, within South and, and Central America more than I have traveled to any other region in the world as secretary. Um, uh, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Peru, Colombia, uh, back again to Argentina. Uh, we, we have a developed presence uh, with health attaches in Mexico uh, and in Brazil. We have opened a new CDC regional office in Brazil as a regional hub. We've got our CDC office in Guatemala. Uh, we have FDA offices in Mexico, Costa Rica, and Chile. Uh, we've got experts that are from CDC that are based in, I think, 10 other countries in the region. Uh, I have played a leading role in dealing with the Venezuelan um, refugee crisis with, all, with my peers. So I helped with, uh, with convening uh, all of the health ministers in the Western Hemisphere to really help and support especially countries like Brazil, Colombia, Peru, uh, who and uh, who have really had to absorb the 5 million refugees who have had to leave because of the oppression of the Maduro regime. 
Uh, and I mean, you can't imagine if you're, I'm trying to remember the exact numbers, but uh, Peru's healthcare system, I think 4 million people in the healthcare system, you add 1 million refugees on top of that that they're providing service to. Um, Colombia, imagine the stresses of the millions of refugees coming across from Venezuela into Colombia, not just in the border areas, but just the, the health system capacity issues that, um, that, 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 that has, the, the challenges that has brought about. So we tried to focus on a couple of things, how we can support especially those neighbors, but also uh, as people would flow through country to country. One of the key innovations that we were able to agree upon is a mutually recognized vaccine card. And so what we do now is whenever the migrants from the refugees from Venezuela uh, first hit um, any uh, health, health uh, tent or refugee center and get vaccinated, Remember, these are people who haven't had measles, diphtheria vaccinations, uh, go through the whole series. Because of the failed Maduro regime, they haven't had any of that. And so we're seeing diphtheria, we're seeing measles, we're seeing all of this um, that, uh, that, that, that we're at risk from. So get them vaccinated, get the card, have this be mutually recognized by all of us in the Western Hemisphere, and then you don't have to worry about people getting revaccinated or the, either the expense or risk of multiple programs. That was, I think, a fantastic example of collaboration among regional health ministers for the benefit of the, both the receiving countries as well as for the migrants. Um, and uh, many other areas that where we've been supporting, uh, we've support, uh, I think we were the founders with uh, Columbia of their field epidemiological training program uh, with, their, with the INS there in, uh, in, in Columbia. We supported, of course, with, uh, with the USAID, the Bahamas, uh, as they were working in the immediate recovery from Hurricane Dorian. Um, we are, of course, the largest donor and supporter of PAHO, uh, which pre-exists the WHO, actually. Uh, so the Panamanian, uh, uh, Pan-American uh, Health Organization, uh, very active in, in that. So uh, it, it's actually it's been interesting, Dean, how deep um, the tie has been. When I was Deputy Secretary um, uh, back in the Bush administration, so much of, of my, the focus of time and travel was actually Europe, uh, European Union, European Commission, big European countries and allies there. Um, that really has, in terms of just my time, energy, and focus, has very much reoriented to our hemisphere and, uh, and, these, uh, and our South American and Central American colleagues. Very tight, deep, good relationships. And uh, what role, uh, in conjunction with HHS, does the uh, private sector or major philanthropic organizations like uh, the Gates Foundation, for example, uh, play in, in our collective effort to be helpful? So we, uh, we work especially out of NIH uh, with Gates. Uh, um, we, we do a lot with the Milken Institute uh, is, another, is another one that we collaborate with, not, of course, financial. They don't need our money, but we collaborate with expertise and agenda setting. Um, in terms of public-private partnerships, I'm thinking of one in particular. I was able to visit um, uh, in, in, U in Brazil, um, one of the key U.S.-Brazil partnerships is with the, uh, uh, the uh, and I will mispronounce it, I fear, the Butantan uh, Institute, uh, which is, of course, one of the, one of the leading uh, virology uh, institutes in the world. And we've got there a quadrivalent dengue vaccine right now uh, that we are collaborating on that's in, I think, phase three clinical trials right now. Uh, uh, so a, a really important uh, collaboration there. Uh, we've worked on tech transfer with them, I think at the, through the phase two clinical trials. Um, and we have our institute in, uh, in Peru that uh, the Naval, uh, Naval uh, Medical Research Unit does where we help focus really on research on so many of the diseases that are endemic in the Amazon basin. Uh, uh, developing therapies for them, doing research there, and then working on tech transfers to try to get uh, biotech pharma companies or local in, in local entities to carry those forward. Okay, thank you. Um, just uh, let's turn to uh, the COVID situation for a moment. So I think it's fair to say that five out of the 10 countries, five out of the 10 countries with the highest per capita death rate are Latin American countries. Uh, so I'm sure we'd be very keen to hear what uh, HHS and uh, our government has done to be helpful uh, with respect to the COVID crisis uh, south. 
So, uh, so we've provided uh, over 3,400 ventilators to assist countries uh, as we were able to create a surplus of ventilators here. Uh, we've been able to, stri to distribute those. We've sent over $137 million of development assistance to help fight the pandemic in the Americas, uh, as well as technical assistance to 24 countries. So, so much of it has been regional collaboration, technical assistance uh, from CDC and then the researchers at NIH. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've put over $20.5 billion invested to combat COVID-19 overall through preparedness and response efforts, foreign assistance, and investments of co in COVID-19 vaccines, diagnostics, and uh, therapeutics. We've got the, um, right now, we've got four vaccines in phase three clinical trials, one of which, uh, the Moderna one, I believe, has a clinical trial site at University of Miami. Uh, we've got monoclonal antibodies, which you've heard a lot about just in the last week. One of them, Regenerons, is I think also in clinical trials at University of, uh, of, of Miami. Um, and then we also have worked with the Inter-American Development Bank on plans to help rebuild the Latin American healthcare system from the impacts coming out of COVID-19. So we play a role on the development side, most of what HHS will do is technical assistance supporting and advising USAID, which has the money for, of course, the, the foreign investment or the Inter-American Inter Development Bank or other entities like that, uh, will, be like the, will be the technical health advisors uh, on that and then also the direct technical assistance through our, as I mentioned, health attaches and CDC people uh, in field. So. I want, to, I want to follow up, if I may, with respect to uh, the COVID response in, in Latin America, because uh, uh, China has, of course, leveraged its manufacturing capacity and PPE uh, to extend its uh, reach uh, fairly, uh, fairly strongly into the region by offering uh, support to uh, uh, our neighbors. Um, is that uh, an issue for concern, and uh, how would you characterize our response vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, that uh, of China? So um, it's very concerning to me how they approach uh, how they approach aid, especially humanitarian aid and development assistance, uh, and it's just a very different approach than the United States has, has historically taken. You know, we're the largest uh, single donor to support global health, uh, bilateral and multilateral in the world, and we're going to remain so. Um, but we, uh, we don't do that with, uh, with strings attached. So uh, we bring humanitarian aid in to our neighbors to assist them, um, and we don't use this as an instrument of soft power um, to try to bring countries along or spheres of influence, et cetera. Um, we do it to be a good neighbor. We do it to be good in the multilateral world. We do it to support global health. We do it to protect Americans because if we can stop disease abroad, it helps prevent it from coming here. Um, China takes a very different approach. It takes a, um, a much more of a what I might call a mercantilist approach using uh, whether it's development assistance, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, funding loans in very much a way that tries to s support uh, their strategic interests um, economically and, and political in multilateral organizations and otherwise. That's not an approach the U.S. has taken. I, um, and I don't think, I, uh, it, it's frustrating in part because the U.S. actually doesn't get credit for how genuinely generous it is in a bilateral and multilateral way in terms of development assistance, global health support, aid, um, in a way that really is just trying to improve the human condition and help prevent the spread of disease, help deal with non-communicable disease, uh, and elevate people. Look at PEPFAR, for instance. I mean, you know, is somewhat less of an issue in, uh, in South America, but I mean, just look at the incredible, miraculous improvement in tens of millions of lives, thanks to the generosity of America there. Um, and not just not just as important as it is saving lives and uh, helping people who suffer with HIV, um, but actually building healthcare infrastructure as a, as, a, as, a, as a collateral benefit of that work of drug distribution, treatment systems, and care that comes from that. I've gotten to see that firsthand as I've fought Ebola in, in, the, in the Central Africa region. I mean, 
there is a reason that the Democratic Republic of Congo was able to, to actually identify the Western Congo outbreak that occurred in May of 2018. They did it by themselves, and they did it because of the investment of the U.S. in programs like PEPFAR, Global Health Security Agenda, building up domestic lab capacity and epidemiological expertise. And you know, we don't get much credit in public fora or multilateral fora for all of this, but we do it. Following up, uh, do, do you think it's helpful then to think of health assistance as an instrument of soft power, or does that diminish the humanitarianism embedded in uh, our approach? Um, I, I, I certainly don't think it's good to think of it as a soft power leverage type <clears throat> way that I, would, that I would say I've seen China do. Uh, I think it is important that we do it out of a genuine spirit of humanitarian assistance. Um, uh, you know, the work that we're, take for example, the work that we're doing on the Venezuelan refugee crisis that I mentioned. Um, you know, we're not go, we, we aren't seeing that here in the United States in terms of an impact on our healthcare system or a direct impact on health in the United States. But we believe it's a good thing to do in our hemisphere. It's a good thing to do to help the surrounding countries uh, to deal with something they didn't, a challenge they didn't ask for, uh, but they have thrust upon them of absorbing 5 million refugees from a country with a completely collapsed healthcare system, completely collapsed health and basic living infrastructure, um, and imposing, as I mentioned, just that Peru example, a, a huge, huge burden on their systems. You know, we sent, uh, on one of my trips to, uh, down to Colombia, um, we sent the USNS Comfort down, and that's our that's our hospital, one of our two big hospital ships. And it was really uh, just a, 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 I think a very moving thing to see. It sat off sat off the coast, and uh, we, we were able to provide care, hospital care, and um, and surgeries for uh, individuals, uh, in Colombia who could not get into their healthcare system because the Venezuelan refugees had overloaded it. And, you know, to be there with my father was an ophthalmologist and to be there, uh, with an ophthalmologist doing cataract surgery on this elderly gentleman who, uh, very, very bad, uh, cataracts and probably hadn't seen in 25 years. Uh, the surgeon removed the cataract and this gentleman pointed up at the wall. And it was a clock. He was just pointing at a clock. He hadn't seen a clock in 20 years. And that was a gift that he's going to, he, his family, everyone in his community, they will remember that forever as an act of American generosity, that we brought that kind of, you know, health service and just a transformative life event for him in 10 minutes. Okay. It's really, I mean, I, so for me, I, I, I find meaning in that type of uh, work that we do. You, uh, you mentioned earlier the vaccine. Um, so let, let's turn now to uh, when a vaccine becomes available. Uh, there's obviously concern about uh, uh, who's going to get it first, second, and third. Um, if you're talking to uh, our friends in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, where are they in line for the vaccine? So let me, let me give you an update in terms of vaccine production uh, for us. So. Uh, we have contracted with or invested in six manufacturers so far for domestic manufacturer vaccines. Um, <clears throat> we, we believe that it's, it, it's realistic as we probabilize the different investment cases and technology platforms that we can have upwards of 100 million doses of FDA authorized or approved vaccine by the end of this year. And then um, uh, have enough vaccine for every American buy that would want it by the end of March, early April. Um, we though have contracts to acquire and to produce uh, well above that. That's just probabilized production. And so we're standing up, I think 23 different manufacturing sites in the United States and vaccine manufacture, as you all may know, is in some ways like a diesel engine. Um, Hard to get it started, but once the engine is going, it runs along quite efficiently in producing. And, and so uh, that's the real art is getting, getting those, once you can get, you know, the, whether it's the 2,500 liter bioreactor going, it can just keep producing. Uh, so we're actually working on developing a strategy because I believe we will have surplus vaccine. Uh, we certainly will have surplus 
ongoing enduring vaccine manufacturing capacity in the United States. Uh, and we are working on a strategy for how, and apologies, but once, once the American population is vaccinated, has what it needs, how we can work in the global community to support others with either the vaccines that we have or the vaccine manufacturing capacity that we'll have in the United States. Uh, and that, that is a priority for us. Um, we we want to make that available. And we're working right now through our interagency process on the strategy for doing that. Uh, we've also worked with a $1.16 billion commitment to the Vaccine Alliance at Gavi uh, in June of 2020. Uh, which is in addition to our normal support of UNICEF, the Global Fund. Uh, so those are going to be critical players in, in, in distributing any COVID-19 vaccine also, in addition to whatever we do more directly. Have uh, any of the vaccine trials uh, incorporated thermostabilization uh, techniques that would enable the vaccine once uh, approved to be distributed without the necessity of having the refrigeration cold chain, which makes it obviously challenging to reach uh, impoverished populations in uh, emerging economies. So not yet, not yet to my knowledge. All of the ones that uh, that we are working with right now uh, do have cold, uh, cold, uh, cha uh, cold chain storage requirements and distribution requirements. So we're working through that even within the U.S. distribution system, how to make that, <clears throat> how to make that work. It's an important consideration, uh, and uh, I, even for U.S. distribution. So I think the technological advances are going to be there. They're just not there. They're not there quite yet. Okay, thank you. I, I think um, you know one, one of the uh, one of the uh, concerns, in addition to uh, the vaccine, has been um, the stress that has been placed on healthcare systems around the world by uh, the COVID uh, crisis. And I'm just wondering whether or not there are fragilities that uh, uh, you have particularly noticed in, in the uh, delivery of health care in the face of this crisis that uh, we can improve upon and be better prepared uh, for uh, what I think many people think is the inevitable next pandemic that's going to hit us uh, at some point in time. Yeah, so uh, I think we've, we've learned through this uh, very novel uh, pathogen. Uh, President Frank and I worked together with Tommy Thompson and Secretary Levitt on pandemic flu preparedness, uh, which is enough of a challenge just in and of itself. Uh, but then adding to that a novel coronavirus in a pandemic status, which has different platforms, say testing. You know, we can incorporate into existing testing infrastructure a, a pandemic flu strain relatively, you know, relatively easily uh, because we have the, the flu, both point of care as well as high throughput public health and hospital based and commercial lab based diagnostic equipment. It's really just a matter of, 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 of swapping in, you know, swapping in your primer, uh, especially on, the, on your PCR testing, for instance. Um, so, the challenge with coronavirus is really developing because it, that coronavirus testing infrastructure didn't exist. So we now have that. Uh, you know, we're, we've got capacity for over 3 million tests a day in the United States, uh, 100 million tests per month, and we're, we're rolling off new point-of-care te techniques of almost every week, it seems. Uh, half of our tests are now point-of-care rapid diagnostics with ever-increasing census sensitivity and specificity and ease of use. Um, and so that has been one of, I think, the key learnings was that that system really had to be built from the ground up uh, because that requires, uh, that's not a matter of the CDC running a global, a nation, national or regional testing system. Uh, that's about standing up a very diverse set of different equipment, platforms, uh, reagents, swabs, uh, extracting reagents, techniques uh, and equipment that happens in a system like the U.S. that doesn't just have, everyone's not on the same piece of equipment. Some hospitals are able to do manual, uh, manual uh, uh, RNA extraction. Others really rely on the cartridge-based systems, which have, of course, lag times for development and production of those. And it just, that is what it is. And I th I'm sure we've seen that in, uh, in, in Central and South America also. And so testing, one key area. Uh, strategic supplies. 
So one of the core, one of the key things is we've all been overly dependent on China for production of some of the basic things like surgical gloves, surgical masks, N95 respirators, uh, gowns, just some of the very basic things. And so President Trump is leading a complete reconception of our strategic national stockpile to onshore that production, to bring that back here to our hemisphere, especially the U.S., but um, frankly, we're open to our partners um, in this hemisphere also standing up that kind of production that can supply the United States needs. Um, we also, through that second generation of our stockpile system, now have visibility across our whole system of distribution. Uh, it, it used to be what we inherited was a strategic stockpile that was very much about biomedical chemical countermeasures and a very small amount of health system, PPE, and hospital capacity for really small dislocations like a tornado or a hurricane, a small regionally focused dislocation, nothing on a national scale. Um, you know, we would buy half a billion of medical countermeasures a year. The U.S. buys a trillion of pharmaceutical and medical and surgical uh, supplies a year. Now we have complete visibility uh, we call it a supply control tower across the U.S. We know where everything goes in the U.S., and we can use our defense production powers to actually move it, allocate it, ration it, make sure it's going where needed most. So huge change there. I think, the, as you mentioned, public-private uh, partnerships, we've, we've really seen how vital that is in the vaccine and therapeutic work, um, the ability to put the full power of the U.S. government, put the money behind that, uh, and perhaps we should be think, thinking in the future about mechanisms in our hemisphere uh, for better collaboration there on public-private partnerships and development in a future pandemic. And then data. You know, um, that's going to be one of the big reforms coming out of this also. Uh, we, we have really relied historically on the CDC getting data feeds that are customized. The CDC wants this type of data, create a one-way street of data, to provide that public health information either into the state, the state then to CDC or direct to CDC, but very much a customized proprietary almost data system. We need to move to a system where we actually are gathering data that's in the clinician's workflow. So it's what you might call two-way validated data. It's data that's actually being used in patient care. So it has internal inherent uh, validation, data scrubbing and quality analytics on it. And the CDC, instead of being simply the, the gatherer, gatherer of unique proprietary data streams, actually becomes a data warehouse aggregator of all data available in the U.S. around public health and applying really a unique national and international perspective on the data and the world's best analytics on top of that. So that's sort of that's going to be the trend for data in the future. So I'd say those four, probably four key lessons learned. Um, where we've been working to try to, uh, to develop for the future. Uh, j just following up, Mr. Secretary, on the, uh, the data point, uh, some people uh, might argue that uh, uh, China uh, was able to suppress its outbreak more effectively as a result of uh, consumer surveillance uh, of uh, smartphones, for example, tracking smartphones as part of the tracing uh, the tracing uh, imperative that is necessary uh, once someone tests uh, positive. Um, I don't think you meant uh, to to go in that direction with your point regarding data, right? So, wh where no, are the no, right. where, where should we set the limits in that regard? No. So I want to be very clear. That was not the type of data that I was talking. Not 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 at all. That type of personal personal um, tracking information, smartphone tracking that you see, say, in China. No, no, what I was talking about is we have existing, our states are gathering public health information. That's information that our state public health departments find useful in their workflow. Our regional health information exchanges are gathering data to support regional interoperable health IT. Um, instead of creating separate data flows that are uniquely just for us, how do we actually work with that data that's actually that users are finding useful already and integrate that and use that for our data purposes. So thank you for giving me this. I want to make that, so I'm glad to be able to clarify that point because I in no way meant uh, that other kind of more surveillance like data. No, this is just public health data that's there. How can we 
tap into the public health data, use it better, um, instead of creating duplicative or unique data streams that may actually have, you know, that don't have that inherent quality validation that comes from being used in the workflow of a local public health department or a clinician providing health care um, in a system. Thank you. Um, I just want to invite the uh, audience on the call to uh, please feel free to send in uh, your questions uh, for the secretary via the Q&A uh, function and uh, we'll move to uh, some of your questions shortly. Um, but uh, perhaps uh, reflecting a little bit on uh, um, the past uh, couple of years and uh, your previous tenure at HHS, you know, I'm wondering what, what are one or two of the things that you're most proud of uh, respect, with respect to your tenure at HHS as uh, secretary and uh, previously and perhaps secondly, um, what priorities would you set, assuming that uh, you were in the role for another uh, four years, uh, what would be the, the priorities for HHS that you think should be pursued? Sure. Um, so I'd say first would be the significant advances to completely restructure how healthcare is supported and delivered in the United States through value-based transformation. So I, I laid out an agenda in my first month or two in office at the beginning of 2018 that I, I wanted to restructure healthcare in America al along the lines of transparency. So transparent price and quality information. Beginning in January, hospitals will have to actually be transparent about the prices they charge for their services. You will actually, for the first time ever, have the right to know what something will cost you uh, before you go in. And a very large percent of our hospital services are actually shoppable. Um, uh, and we're gonna be doing that similarly uh, for insurance companies and the information, getting that transparent price and quality information. Uh, I said, I wanna redevelop so that we pay not for procedures and sickness, but for outcomes. And so we've changed kidney care, for instance. The first change is to how we pay for kidney care and deliver kidney, kidney care uh, since President Nixon. Uh, and so now, instead of paying for center-based dialysis, we're moving our models to pay practitioners to keep you from advancing in your chronic kidney disease to higher stages of it, to keep you from ever needing dialysis. We're paying to keep you from center-based dialysis and supporting you with home-based dialysis if you need that. We're paying to get you a transplant instead of keep you on center-based dialysis. So the other area of, of value-based transformation um, on, on these models that I love, is called the direct contracting model. So pay a provider to actually take on the risk for man helping to manage a patient's healthcare conditions, actually reward them for delivering high quality outcomes for you, keeping you out of the hospital, um, delivering good outcomes. And what does that do? That says, instead of us micromanaging what we pay for, pay the provider to work with you, and, if, and they can then focus on including the social determinants of health. Um, it might be that an air conditioner at your house will help keep you be home at home instead of needing to enter a long-term care facility. You might need home-based, home-delivered meals. That's a bet that a provider system can make working with you uh, that could actually deliver a health outcome if you align the quality outcome incentives between the patient and the physicians and the financial incentives around that. Um, we've the third area was interoperability. We now have mandated interoperability of all of our health IT information in the United States, so you can move from system to system. Uh, and we've re we are reforming and have reformed key elements that really were antiquated regulatory provisions that kept providers from collaborating with each other. So that value-based transformation is key. That's an area that I, if I'm privileged to stay for another you know, four years, I want to keep driving that. You don't get that done just in three years. That's, that is foundational for 331 million Americans in healthcare for more choice, better quality, better outcomes. Um, I'm very proud of our work uh, on the opioid crisis. I mean, we've seen a 38% increase in the number of Americans receiving medication-assisted treatment. 
uh, which is the gold standard for, for, for getting people into recovery and keeping them in recovery long term. Uh, I am uh, quite proud of our work uh, beginning the Ending HIV Epidemic Initiative. Um, it is within sight that within a decade we can end the HIV epidemic here in the United States. We have the tools to do it. We brought an execution system uh, in play to do that. So as we think, if I get those, you know, additional time, I want to I w obviously want to finish that fight against COVID-19. I want to get vaccines and therapeutics across the finish line, make them avail available for people. Uh, I want to continue that value-based transformation. And um, I'd like us to focus on our human services side of our portfolio and how do we rethink our programs to really help people who can move from dependence to independence. Mm -hmm. Okay, terrific, thank you. Uh, let, let's just go to a few audience questions. I'm going to abbreviate uh, the questions uh, just in the interest of time. Um, number one, ma many Latin American and Caribbean countries are members of the WHO. Uh, wouldn't it be better for the U.S. to stay within the WHO and uh, reform from within rather than withdraw? If we thought we could, we could reform from within, uh, we would stay. Uh, but the response from the WHO has, they've just, they've failed on two key regards. Uh, one is to demonstrate their independence from the Communist Party of China, and two, is uh, to, gen to be genuinely interested in structural reform, to be an impartial, unbiased force in the world that can actually enforce the international health regulations and enforce the type of transparency, collaboration, and cooperation that's needed internationally. Um, the recalcitrance is what drives the United States decision here. Um, if if, you know, if, if the attitude were to change, if there were significant reforms and significant demonstration of independence, um, uh, I can't speak for the president, but uh, um, that's been the goal. That's been the goal. And he, sort of, he was forced into the position of having to say, we're going to have to lead because we're just not seeing, we're not seeing that type of reform from within in spite of our very clear demands for that. Uh, ne thank you. Next. Um how can we increase vaccine acceptance and reduce vaccine hesitancy? Uh, very important issue, very important question. Um, it was already a critical issue. We saw that with the measles outbreak that we had last year. We see it every year. I, I hate the fact that every year um, I have to see over 100 children die in the United States from flu who, could, who were not vaccinated. Um, and so we already have enduring vaccine hesitancy. On COVID-19, the best thing we can do is be transparent <clears throat> and show the independence of the process. We're going to have independent data and safety monitoring board that will determine if the data even meets pre-specified statistical endpoints before anyone even sees it. Two, the drug companies are going to have to ensure that data meets their own ethical standards for submission. Three, the FDA has published vaccine guidance and EUA vaccine guidance that is public and transparent as to what they're looking for. Four, the FDA will use an independent, public, transparent advisory committee process to get advice on approval. Five, the FDA will make the decision that a vaccine meets, meets those standards. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, why, why is the uh, administration still challenging the Affordable Care Act? So the position of the United States in the Supreme Court and in the litigation is a statutory construction and constitutional position that once the president secured removal of the, um, of the fee, the tax for uh, the individual mandate, the Supreme Court held that Obamacare was constitutional because it was part of the taxing authority of the Congress. Congress repealed the tax. Once that tax is gone, the mandate necessarily must fall. And the Obama administration themselves said that if the individual mandate is an integral and completely connected part of the statute, that the, the question then becomes, does the whole statute fall without the individual mandate structure in it, which the Obama administration itself had articulated was a centerpiece of it all. So it's a statutory construction question uh, of what, uh, and we'll see what the court rules. Um, but President Trump's gonna, gonna fight with, to ensure that anything, if the court strikes down all or a large part of Obamacare because of that, that, uh, that pre-existing people with pre-existing conditions are protected, 
and that we work to actually provide real affordable access to health care and health insurance and health financing vehicles in a way that I think will be better than where Obamacare has been. Has the COVID crisis aggravated uh, uh, mental health uh, concerns in the uh, United States and presumably in the region as well? And uh, what does HHS do uh, to address in its initiatives, uh, the mental health challenges that we face. Yeah, a absolutely. So we've, we've seen a dramatic increase and we've got various call in numbers of the suicide hotline or the disaster hotline. We've seen dramatic increases in people seeking help um, there. Uh, we know that for every 1% increase in unemployment, we see a 1% increase in suicidality in the United States. Um, no, we're gonna, we're gonna, this will be an enduring mental health uh, challenge for us uh, from the economic social dislocation that has come from uh, uh, people sheltering in place from, of course, the, uh, the uh, unemployment, economic dislocation. Uh, that's why we've been trying to get people back to work, back to school, back to worship, back reintegrated in their communities, really back to health care, back to elective procedures, to screening diagnostics, back to seeking behavioral health interventions. And that's why we've been so adamant about um, the three W's that with, with washing your hands, watching your distance, wearing your face coverings when you can't watch your distance, these are tools that can have an impact that are almost as, as much as, as actually sheltering in place and shutting down. We've seen that. Uh, and we can be an empowerment to get that reconnection with the community that's actually really important to mental health care. A um, couple of questions um, on inequities. So, has uh, COVID exposed inequities in the healthcare system uh, that might not previously have been uh, realized? Has it magnified those inequities? And I guess a related question, um, have the economic effects, the economic costs of the crisis been greater than the healthcare costs? Uh, that's a good, very good question. So in terms of inequities and disparities, um, yes, of course, the, the COVID crisis has absolutely brought those to the fore. You know, we see hospitalization rates in the African-American community, um, Hispanic community, uh, American Native communities at four to five times Caucasian in terms of impact. Um, and so we've, we've seen a, a tremendous uh, a disparate uh, impact here. And we need to study that and get to the bottom of all of the, the many reasons that can be driving that. Uh, part of that is getting data. So we've required that with lab testing, that demographic information be submitted so that we can help track that uh, better uh, than we could at the beginning of this outbreak. Now, we've invested <clears throat> with, uh, uh, with, with monies with the historically uh, black medical colleges to help uh, assist us in more culturally sensitive and relevant communications about the risks of COVID and the community mitigation efforts that are appropriate to that. Uh, under the leadership of NIH and our Surgeon General and the Office of Minority Health, we have tried um, vigorously to enhance minority community enrollment in vaccine clinical trials and other clinical trials because especially with the, <clears throat> the enhanced impact, the, the disparate impact in those communities, we have to be sure that our vaccine trials uh, have adequate numbers that are appropriate, appropriate diversity and representation in those trials of different communities. So those are some of the steps we've taken, but I think it's going to be a very, it's going to be a long journey to absolutely highlighted uh, underlying disparities. Um, so let, let, let's end uh, with a couple of questions from uh, some leading members of our medical school and health system community here at the University of Miami. Um, one question relates to uh, your plans for improving electronic medical records. Uh, how will they allow practitioners to better focus on key indicators of health? Uh, and then a second uh, question relating to the doctor-patient relationship and how uh, policy changes at HHS can, can reinforce that essential ingredient to effective uh, health delivery? So in terms of electronic medical records, um, what, what happened in the previous 10 years, so Secretary Levitt, my predecessor, got us, predecessor and mentor, got us started on the journey towards electronic medical records. And he insisted 
<clears throat> that we drive towards interoperability because he didn't want us to end up with a balkanized system where um, this hospital system, this medical practice, this hospital system, they can't talk to each other and the patient remains captive uh, between those systems. What we saw in the subsequent 10 years, eight to 10 years, was unfortunately major investments in electrifying paper records. So instead of a genuine clinical assist from the way medical records were electrified, it was simply taking the file cabinet and putting it in electric form. Um, that's where our interoperability regulations are, is to change that and to move from that system to genuine interoperability, patient ownership of your health information, transportability of that information that you own with you where you want to go, and changing from the providers spending all of their time uh, trying to comply with requirements around it to the electronic health record being actually a tool that enhances clinical care delivery. There was so much micromanagement about the how and not enough focus just on the what that we need. The what we need is the information's electric, it's portable with the patient, um, and it's it, and interoperable, and get out of the way of so much micromanagement. That's been our general philosophical approach about EMRs. We want you looking, if the doctor's looking at the screen instead of the patient, that's failure mode. That's, that's, that we need, be, and I guess the second point is, the core to everything we wanna do <clears throat> is reinforcing that healthcare provider patient relationship. We want that at the center of, of everything. We wanna make sure that your financing vehicles um, uh, give you as much choice as possible in uh, your doctor. Uh, we wanna make sure uh, that you have access to uh, the to practitioners, uh, whether nurse practitioners, PAs, doctors, nurses, that can practice to the full extent of their licensure and medical training, removing any artificial barriers to trade there and barriers to access, especially as we think about underserved areas and rural and frontier areas. Um, we want to, we are enabling telehealth. You know, we've, thanks to the president's leadership here in, in, in COVID under the national emergency, I've been able to um, unleash telehealth for the first time ever in our country. Um, now, some of that's going to require statutory change to be able to keep it. I think if anyone tries to roll that backwards, they're going to face a revolution because um, I think patients, doctors, hospitals, they've all seen finally the promise of, of telemedicine, telehealth, and that kind of interaction. Uh, and we see that there's systemic cost reduction. It used to always be a fear that it would just jack up more procedures by telephone. We're actually seeing the substitution effect, um, which is a lower cost, more efficient. Uh, we still obviously need to learn how to do that well, but the ability to connect with your provider through telemedicine. We have community health centers. This is the, the, the center, the over 14,000 centers around the country provide care to the most underserved. Um, they've got some of over 90% of their services are delivering telehealth. And then they'll have drive through for, for lab work, vaccination, et cetera. I mean, think about that as an as a access expander to more population that they can reach by being so much more efficient. So I, I think just it's going to be a constant progression of how we reinforce that relationship and enable it. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you on behalf of uh, the University of Miami for uh, sharing with us today a tremendous amount of insight and information that you've provided. Uh, we wish you good luck and uh, thank you for your service. Thank you very much, Dean and President. I uh, really appreciate being with all of you today. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Secretary. Great honor to see you again.